Meanwhile, there always seemed to be time for the press and their helicopters. The story of the Stone Age cavemen seemed too good to give up. There were quarrels with Elizalde, complaints that publicity seemed to be his main concern. Film star turned photojournalist Gina Lola Brigida got in to see the Tassadai, but no full-scale, long-term anthropological study could be arranged. The Tassadai area had been declared a national preserve. Then, in 1974, the stream of visitors was stopped, and the press and the scientists were ordered out. There would be no further study of the gentle Tassadai. It was said that these people not only lived in caves, but they had left no remains whatsoever in those caves of the food they ate or the tools they had. Archaeologists know that this is an impossibility. As to the nature of their culture, it was said that they had no hunting technology of any kind, no fishing technology of any kind. They had to catch the fish by hand. The largest thing they had ever eaten that was a living, moving being was a frog. and no carrying or storing technology, such as baskets or uh, bags. Uh, people that are supposedly gathering wild food products have no way to carry it except in their hands. They had no rituals of any kind, nor any ritual specialists, or any religious specialists, no folklore. These are not only improbabilities, but impossibilities. There's no group of people in the last 40,000 years that's been without those kinds of cultural features. Berriman believes that the Tassadai were the invention of Manda Elizaldi, either for political and economic gain, or perhaps just for glory. The people in the leaf skirts were farmers who never lived in the caves. The Tassadai tools would be of almost any shape. They just pick them up from the riverbed and tie them up uh, after them and you had the, the tool. The hafting itself is quite strange, quite haphazard and rather uh, loose. And those tools, it seems, would be quite adequate for crushing nuts, for scraping rat iron and a certain number of tasks like this. They weren't used for very heavy-duty tasks. But from everything that we know about the Tassadai, they were not clearing the forest, building houses, hollowing out canoes and so on. No, the mere fact that the Tassadai tools seem to be so simply made and so crude and so irregular by itself doesn't convince me that they are a fake. One problem in assessing the other tool evidence is that there's so little of it. The Tassadai explained that once Defal had given them knives, they abandoned their stone tools. But where did the stone tools go? If they had been using them for hundreds of years, wouldn't there be at least a few left lying around? None were reported found. But what about the language? The linguistic studies had led to the conclusion that the Tassadai had been isolated for as much as 800 years. Unlike their neighbors, the Tassadai lacked foreign words in their language that would have indicated more recent contact with other cultures. Or did they? They possess uh, the word uh, Diwata which is a Sanskrit term for God, divinity. This uh, word uh, could not have entered the Philippines earlier than the 14th century. I did, in my publication of the 70s, point out that Tassad, I have the term Diwata, which means deity or honorific. They use it in only one context, and that is to refer to Manda Elizalde. They don't use it in the context you would expect to use the term deity. Uh, that leads me to believe that it may be a recent loanword, and in fact they say that they learned that term from the Fall to refer to Elizalde. Were they simply lying? Again, Carol Maloney says that if they were, 
their words would have betrayed them. The hoax theorists are claiming that these are people from surrounding villages who are called away from their farms to go into masquerade as primitives in the forest and then to return to their fields. This implies that they would have to carefully exclude from their speech while they were speaking this Tassadai language all of these, this rich complex of agricultural terms, including the metaphors that you find in those surrounding languages. Just imagine yourself excluding from your own speech all of those agricultural metaphors. Uh, there isn't a grain of truth to that. Um, sowing the seeds of disruption. Uh, I'm going to plow that money back into the firm. Imagine the children sharing in this conspiracy that they would never slip and never use any of these terms either. It's simply very implausible. What about the caves? Did the Tassadai really live in them? No archaeological dig has ever been attempted to test the claim. But there is this piece of circumstantial evidence. It's a film made in 1974 by the last of the original researchers, Professor Iranius Eibel Eibelsfeld. Eibel Eibelsfeld is an ethologist. He studies the minute details of human behavior, sometimes resorting to the use of a specially mirrored camera so that his subjects are less aware they're being filmed. He is convinced that the Tassadai were authentic cave dwellers. He does not believe these children were just pretending. If they were, he says, they were very, very good actors. They've told Philippine television they were real. <laughs> Malayam says he is a Tassada. Headland believes our understanding of the Tassada has changed as our own ideas about hunter-gatherers have shifted. Here was a group that fit the model perfectly. Uh, the Tassadi were described as extremely affluent people. National Geographic said that uh, the man on, a man only had to work about two hours a day to supply food for his family. Uh, that they were in very good health. They, they were so peaceful and leisure they didn't even have any word for war. And While the scientific argument continues, life for the Tassadi goes on. Some of the children of 1972 now have children of their own. And while they still don leaves for the occasional film crew that is granted access to their preserve, they seem just as comfortable in Western dress. They have befriended their Manobo neighbors, and intermarriage has increased their number from 21 to 62. They are just beginning to learn agriculture from the Manobo, they say. A new beginning, they call it. And while the Tassadai past may be forever debated, it is possible to construct a kind of likely story that fits the scientific evidence. One plausible history of the Tassadai people. In fact, there were people all over the Philippines that were hiding in the forest from slave raiders in those days. For some reason, this group stayed. For the Tassadai, perhaps, what began as techniques necessary to survive with only a poor diet and crudely made stone tools slowly became a new way of life. As generations passed, memories of the outside world dimmed. Perhaps by 1971, the descendants really did believe they were the only human beings on the planet. More likely, like many other refuge groups we know about, the Tassadai had occasional contact with outsiders, gathering over the years bits and pieces of the modern world. Far from an idealized image of the remote past, the Tassadai may, in the end, present us with a darker picture of the tangled present. 
they adapted to an economic life of hunting and gathering and uh, foraging and, in my view, trading with their farmer neighbors downriver. Then, 1971, along comes Manuel Elizalde and his helicopter. Well, this changed Tassadai life forever. As the Tassadai enter their third decade of celebrity, it may seem that the end to the controversy about them is in sight. But the main combatants in this strange story remain unconvinced. This is turning into a circus, and it is not possible. After 20 years, any opportunity there might have been for science to study an isolated group is gone. If the Tassadai took to the rainforest to escape the wider world, their days of refuge are over. And the pressure on their small society continues. Lobo says we are real Tassadai. Yes, there are many people who are disturbing us, telling us we are not Tassadai. We come here to affirm ourselves as real Tasadai. Real Tasadai. Yeah. No.